Hello, and welcome to another edition of Dumpster Dives. You know all those companies that send you loot boxes where you pay them a subscription fee and they send you a box of useless junk every month? Well, here's my idea of a loot box. Ugh. This was a local Craigslist listing that I picked up for just a few dollars, and it's literally a crate full of ancient computer stuff. I mean, just look at all the stuff that's in here. We've got several 9-track tapes from a mainframe or something similar. We'll have to read those later because I don't have a reader for these. We've got about a dozen or so PCMCIA modem and Ethernet cards. We've got a bunch of hard drives. We'll see if any of these are still working. We have what looks like a hundred or so old RAM modules. I'll have to go through these and maybe test a few of them. I don't know if I have motherboards that support all of these, but we'll see. We've got a few floppy disks unlabeled. I'll see if I can read anything from these. And we have a number of quarter-inch cartridge tapes. These are interesting. So I think I'm going to begin processing this crate of goodies by reading the contents of these quarter-inch cartridge tapes. Because, who knows, there could be some historically significant, archaeologically significant data on these. So, uh, let's get started. So, here's what I'm going to need to do to prepare for reading these tapes. For most kinds of old media recovery like this, I like to use this workstation here, which actually used to be my personal desktop PC years ago. I think this is from 2007-2008. And what I like about this is the motherboard has a lot of features that bridge the gap between modern technology and previous technology from years past. So, for example, it has a floppy drive controller, so I can plug in floppy drives if I need to. Obviously, it has PCI slots, so we can plug in all kinds of adapter cards. I already have a SCSI adapter card here. Uh, it's got a native parallel port and serial port, all that good stuff. And it also has... USB ports, so I can plug in the USB drive and boot up from it if I need to boot into a special operating system, or if I need to dump contents from some kind of old media onto a USB drive. And then of course it has an Ethernet port, so I can offload data onto another server on my network. So, what else do we need to read these tapes? Well, I happen to have this tape drive here. This is a Tandberg 3600 quarter-inch tape drive, which should be compatible with these tapes. This drive was made around 1990 and still works perfectly. And you can see it's not that much larger than the tape itself, so a pretty efficient design. It's supposed to go into a five and a quarter inch slot in your PC, but I prefer to keep this workstation minimal and then add stuff onto it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm actually going to remove this top metal cover from the drive, so we'll be able to see it reading the tape in action. And this is a SCSI tape drive, so I'm going to take my 50-pin SCSI cable coming from the adapter card, plug that in, make sure to have a terminating resistor on your SCSI cable, and plug in the power to the drive, and just like that, I have a setup for reading these tapes. But, are we actually ready to put this tape into that drive? The answer is absolutely not. Because first, we need to inspect these tapes very closely and perform a little bit of reconditioning. And I'll show you what I mean in a bit. To understand what we need to do here, we need to talk a little bit about the history of these tapes and how exactly they work and why the design of these tapes is really terrible, I'm sorry to say. Quarter-inch cartridge tapes were introduced around the late 1970s by 3M and became really popular through the 80s and 90s. These were designed to be a cost-effective backup solution where you could buy a tape drive like this for a few hundred dollars and then buy tape cartridges like this for maybe $20 a piece. So these were used by individuals, by small businesses, uh, BBS operators, all kinds of organizations for making backups. And they're called quarter-inch cartridges because the tape inside is a quarter-inch wide. And the tape can have multiple tracks on it, like this model of tape actually has 18 tracks squeezed into the width of a quarter-inch. So it does take advantage a little bit of the two-dimensional nature of the tape. 
And when the tape drive reads the tape, it reads one track at a time, winding the tape back and forth until it reads all the tracks. And that's called a serpentine pattern of reading the tracks. So here's how these tapes work. You can see the cartridge has two spools that the tape winds onto, but if you look in the back, the spools are actually not accessible from the outside. It's just solid metal. This is different from something like a cassette tape where the spools are accessible in the center and that's how they're turned. So how do these spools get turned? Well, it all happens through this little plastic wheel that protrudes through the top of the cartridge. And if we take the cover off one of these tapes, we can see how it works. There's actually an elastic belt that winds around the plastic wheel at the top and then all the way around these wheels on either end. And as the elastic belt winds around, it hugs the tape spools. So when you turn the plastic wheel, it causes the whole belt to turn and causes the spools to turn with it. So it's a pretty clever system at first glance because it has the benefit of being totally enclosed and, you know, the motion of the wheel ensures that the motion of the spools will be nice and uniform. But there's a fatal design flaw here, which is this elastic belt is under constant tension, permanent tension. And what do you think will happen to any elastic material if it sits under constant tension for 30 years? It's going to lose its elasticity. And when it loses elasticity, it's either going to break, or even if it doesn't break, it's going to become rigid and no longer be able to have the friction to move the tape spools properly. So in both cases, the tape is going to become unusable because the only thing that can turn the spools, which is the little plastic wheel at the top, no longer works. In other words, these tapes are pretty much guaranteed to fail if you let them sit for a long enough time. Oh yeah, actually here's a tape that looks like it has a broken belt. Let's just take this apart. Just a couple of screws in the back. Pop the cover off. Oh yeah, look at this. I see this time and again, the belt is completely broken. You see that? So once again, the data on the actual tape might be perfectly good, but it's completely inaccessible because the plastic wheel doesn't do anything anymore. And there's actually one other design flaw, which is, you see where the belt hugs the tape spools? That's actually the data side of the tape, the oxide side. So the whole time the tape is being used, the belt is constantly rubbing and disturbing the oxide surface of the tape, which certainly reduces its lifespan also. And I've even seen cases where the belt degrades and starts sticking to the tape. And if you put a tape like that into a tape drive and the tape drive starts turning the belt, and the belt is stuck to the tape, it can actually rip the tape physically, which would be a disaster. So those are the issues with quarter-inch cartridges, but because of their low cost, these became really popular throughout the 80s and 90s, and uh, these went through many iterations and form factors and different capacities. Like, this was the original form factor, and I think the original capacity was 20 megabytes, and then it went up to 60 megabytes, uh, this tape can hold 150 megabytes. I think this was the most popular capacity, at least from what I've seen. There were also other form factors, like this miniature quarter-inch cartridge. This is basically just a smaller version of the original, but still uses the same quarter-inch tape inside. There were also these Travan tapes, which were an evolution of the mini cartridge, but a slightly wider package and also slightly wider tape inside to accommodate more tracks. There were weird variations like this TR1 Extra cartridge. This basically has the same sort of business end as the miniature cartridge, but also uses wider tape. And it has larger spools, so it goes longer in this direction. And this can hold one gigabyte. There were also these Ditto cartridges made by iOmega, the same company that made zip drives, if you remember those. This uses pretty much the same packaging as the miniature cartridge, but also uses the wider tape. And this holds two gigabytes. And so these tapes continued all the way into the early 2000s, and they had capacities going all the way up to 20 gigabytes. But the point is, all of this whole little family of cartridges uses the same flawed mechanism of the tension belt inside. So they all suffer from this issue of eventually failing for that same reason. 
So thankfully, by the early 2000s, we already had things like burnable DVDs and superior tape technology like LTO, so these tapes finally went away by the mid-2000s. But fast forward to today, if somebody wants to read the data from an old tape like this, the thing we have to do before even attempting to read it is open it up and replace that belt. Because if the tape's been sitting for a long time, it's almost guaranteed that the belt will need replacing. And yes, thankfully the belt can be replaced. But now the question is, where do we find a new belt for a tape like this? Well, luckily there's an easy answer. Actual rubber bands. These are Plastiband rubber bands, and this green one in particular is the exact size and tension to serve as a replacement belt for these tapes. So let's put this on. I'm gonna remove the old belt, throw this out, and I'm gonna clean off some of the gunk left behind by the old belt that degraded on these wheels here. Clean that off thoroughly. By the way, I'm able to safely work on the inside of this tape right now because the length of the tape that's protruding here is actually before the data on the tape starts. So the tape is fully rewound and uh, what we're seeing here is before the data begins. So I can actually safely touch the spools and even touch the tape without worrying about damaging the data. Okay, I'm gonna wind the rubber band around the plastic wheel at the top then pass it through in between the spools, then wind it onto this wheel here, and then stretch it all the way up to here, and that's it. The new belt is on, and I'm just gonna work the spools a little bit to tighten the tape very carefully, and this is working. I can put the cover back on, So now, finally, we're ready to read this tape. I'm gonna turn on my PC here. I just have a very basic install of Linux here. It supports pretty much every type of tape drive. It doesn't require any special drivers. It's great. Let's pop the tape in. Now the first thing the tape drive does is it winds the tape all the way forward and then back. That's called retensioning the tape. And that's going to ensure that the tape has even tension all throughout so that it reads properly. So that'll just take a minute. Okay, it's done retensioning, so now, at last, finally, we're ready to read it. Well, I'm just gonna go all or nothing. I'm gonna type a command that should dump the contents of this tape onto this PC. I think that's right, and here we go. That's working! <laughs> it's reading data from the tape. Look at that. It's already read over a megabyte from the tape. It's reading 30-year-old data from this cartridge. That is unbelievable. It's working. <laughs> uh, that's great. Two megabytes. Okay, well, I'll pause here until it finishes. Okay, well this just finished reading and I got a total of 50 megabytes from this tape without a single error along the way. So this green makeshift rubber band drive belt worked flawlessly. And there we have it, another successful tape recovery. And I'm looking forward to doing the rest of these in just a bit. So, in conclusion, I have a love-hate relationship with these tapes. I mean, in general, I'm a big fan of tape media for backup purposes. In fact, for some of my own personal backups, I actually use LTO tapes. 
I'll have to make a separate video about that at some point. But these quarter inch cartridges, uh, it's just so unfortunate because on the outside, they have such a nice rugged design. I mean, look at this metal backing. This is solid aluminum and a really thick plastic exterior protecting the tape that's inside. This really feels substantial in your hands. It almost feels indestructible. But then we look inside and there's just the flimsiest rubber band that's guaranteed to fail over time and make this whole thing useless. It's just really bizarre and unfortunate that this kind of design choice was not only released into production, but actually took off and became really popular. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching and till next time.